All right. So, uh, so far we've been uh, working with uh, these spreadsheet-based numerical simulations. And now today we're gonna introduce how to do this in VinSim um, and an insight maker. So uh, we're gonna start with this kind of toilet example, which is your kind of latest homework assignment. You've been done it to do it has to do in a spreadsheet. Uh, and this, uh, and then in the last homework assignment uh, before the midterm, uh, uh, which is officially released today, um, you'll be asked to build this in VinSim. So, but there's going to be gratuitous hints to the spreadsheet implementation in the slides to come. And towards the end of this, gratuitous hints to how to build it in VinSim um, in the last couple slides here. So keep an eye on that. The basic system here, we've got the back of a toilet. So here's our toilet here. Here's the tank that fills up with water. And so that water is the water that's used to flush the tank. And so um, in order to be ready for um, the next flush, it always has to have a certain buffer of water in here that empties out at the flush and then has to then uh, refill at some slow rate. So there's always a water level in the back and uh, there is a target water level, which is effectively set by this little float here that when it floats up to a particular height, um, it can turn off a valve. And so there is this valve that's controlled by the float, which affects the amount of water coming in. So effectively what the valve is doing or what this float is doing with this device here is it's sort of creating a tank gap. Like it's sort of saying, what is the gap between reality and what we want? And so it always wants target water level to be in the back of the tank and it measures that reality. And then it uses a balancing feedback loop to drive uh, water into the tank to bring the water level up. That's the idea there. So <clears throat> if we look at all of that action, this is that balancing feedback loop. So it's this uh, simple example of where we've got this uh, water level down here. And as the water level rises, the tank gap gets smaller. But if you have a large tank gap, then the water level is going to, because the valve is turned on, is gonna start rising faster. And if somehow you change the target water level, so a lot of times you can go into a toilet and you can adjust, um, you can kind of screw this, uh, this, this bulb higher up or lower down on this arm, and that allows you to change the target water level. So if you were to increase the target water level, that would make an increase on the tank gap, but it doesn't sort of change the balancing feedback loop. That's just between water level and tank gap. So this is a high level description of what's going on. It doesn't really tell us about the dynamics, like the valve, doesn't really show up in here. So if we really look at this toilet, you can say, well, the flow of water, um, that's what, you know, this, 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 uh, this float here, adjusts this valve, which is effectively controlling the flow of water. So really, if we wanna get a dynamical model of the, this, we need the flow of water to be explicitly modeled in there. So that's, we're just gonna introduce it as an important variable, because we know that you can't change the water level without changing the flow of water. So that's what we, um, we need to add to that. So what we're gonna end up seeing is that water level will be a stock because it's changing over time. Flow of water will be the force causing it to change. Well, that's the flow. And these things will sort of be converters which help us build the math to make the flow work. The flow makes the water level. So, um, so that's, this is our basic causal loop diagram for what's going on in here. And we're gonna use that to build a dynamical model of the toilet. And so the way that will end up looking here is we take that water level and I say we make it a stock. We take that flow and we do the flow here. So this thick line means it's the thing responsible for changing the water level. The fact that it's going in means that as the flow of water is positive, the water level tends to increase. So that's the difference between inflow and outflow is that when this thing is positive, it will cause this to increase over time. If it were an outflow, if the outflow was positive, it would cause this to decrease over time. The water level is used to calculate tank gap by subtracting off the target water level. In other words, target water level minus water level gives us tank gap. And then that difference is what drives the flow of water. So this is closer to a dynamical model of what's going on there for the model what's happening over time with the, the filling of that. So somehow inside this uh, stock and flow diagram, we need to put equations in for tank gap, 
and for flow of water. But once we do that, we should be able to simulate it in either a spreadsheet or in VinSim or in Insight Maker. So uh, with that in mind, so we can kind of keep an index of everything here. If we want to sort of apply that to our, our uh, kind of spreadsheet template for these stock and flow models. And so again, what are all our stocks? Well, water level is our stock here. It's also called a state variable or an accumulator or a level or a box variable. These are all names for stocks. Um, our converters, which are just auxiliary variables that help make the math uh, cleaner in the expressions, our target water level, which is just a constant 15, and tank gap, which will just be a target water level minus water level. So it's like 15 minus the level. And then the flows are the things that um, are actually causing the water level to change. So the integral under the flow is the water level, or the derivative of the water level is the flow. In this case, our flow is the simple flow of water. And then we've got these links that we've put on here, um, which help us show how things are related. And they work exactly the same as they did in causal loop diagrams. Now, they don't, you don't, uh, in a stock and flow diagram, sometimes it's not possible to associate a polarity to them. So um, in that case, if it's sort of an informational link, like it might be the formula for tank gap doesn't have a clear relationship to water level. So for certain levels of water level, there's a positive relationship for other levels that are negative, kind of like in that fish regeneration curve at certain densities, there was a positive relationship and in other densities, there's a negative. So you're not always uh, uh, able to label the links plus and minus. If you can, that can help with uh, the, the, the reader understand what's going on. But those are auxiliary things. You don't need to put those in stock and flow diagrams. We just sometimes do to, to help us recognize feedback loops and their polarities. So whenever we do a stock and flow diagram, as you'll see in Moorcroft, um, because you'll read the chapter for um, Tuesday, um, is that you're, you always couple a stock and flow diagram with its equations. Now, the diagram you know, hopefully gets like all of the really salient features about the system um, to the reader. But if the reader needs to really know the details, what is the formula used for tank gap? What was exactly the target water level? Et cetera, et cetera, you need to have those formulas nearby in a caption somewhere or something. So, whenever you draw a stock and flow diagram that is meant to be simulated, you're also going to need to have a list of expressions next to it. And, um, and those expressions are typically going to have the formulas um, inside the flows, the formulas inside the converters, and I don't have it here, but also the initial conditions for any of your stocks. And then you often put the time step, the DT value. Um, which we'll talk about here in a second. So this is most of those here. The target water level is 15. The tank gap, there's the formula. The flow of water, uh, there's the formula. It just copies the tank gap. And I've added in units for these just to help the reader see that tank gap is centimeters and flow of water centimeters per second. What's nice about the units is it can also help me debug my logic to see if I might have left things out. So some of you might notice that tank gap is in centimeters, even though flow of water is in centimeters per second. And so it seems like there's something wrong here. And we will see that we are missing one little thing that we're kind of assuming is, is equal to one. And so we don't worry about it at this level. But when we get um, to a little bit more advanced model of the toilet, then these units will match up again. So right now it is a problem um, in the formal sense that flow of water is expecting centimeters per second, but it's taken a variable that's in centimeters. But for now, don't worry about that. But definitely include the formulas. And then, like I said, the other formulas you need to include are the initial water level, zero, and the time step. So um, you always sort of have this diagram and this level of formulas. And so this stuff down here, this is what you always should have together. You never really present the stock and flow diagram without these nearby. You don't have to make these focal because they're kind of distracting, but you do. They, if you have this and these things, then anybody can take your diagram, draw it themselves, and reproduce your results. And that's what we really care about is reproducibility. And you can't reproduce the results unless you've got both the diagram and the formulas. So um, before I go into seeing how this is implemented in the spreadsheet, um, are there questions about any of this so far? The water level being a stock, the flow of water being a flow, um, any of these formulas. Okay. 
Any questions online? Okay, good. All right, so this is what we would like put in a report or something, or if we were, um, you know, writing a um, a paper on, you know, the right optimization of of toilet tanks. You know, this is what we would put in the figure in the paper, and then maybe an appendix. We would have these formulas, um, but then how do we actually implement that to get the graphs out? Well, if we did in a spreadsheet, then we can take this formula again. If you give me all of this and all of that, I can reproduce your results by myself. So. I can look at this, I can identify the stocks, the flows, the converters, and all the formulas. And now I can build a little spreadsheet model. This is assignment D2 basically here. So, you know, this is me kind of walking through those steps. So you'll have to do a little bit on your own, uh, but this is giving you a good start of um, that assignment where I'm asking you to basically simulate this, where the bonus is you also add a leak coming out of it, which I won't show you how to do that. But, um, but this is basically showing you how to get through that assignment. So it's very similar to the bacterial flow case. Uh, we have, we start with a DT up here, uh, but then instead of having lifetimes and, and average times between births, our um, main static converter variable here, our exogenous variable is target water level. So we put that up here and there's no W or L or anything like that that's in the bacteria. We put that up here. And then down here, we set up our um, initial row. So our time zero row, we put our initial condition for water level and we start calculating formulas. So uh, we know that before we can put in the flow of water formula, we have to put in the tank gap formula. So the tank gap formula is just gonna be the target water level minus the water level. So both of those are in column B here. Target water level has got the dollar signs around it. It's just this exogenous variable here. And, um, and then the actual water level for this time step is right here B5. It's just the current row, uh, that column, and that gives me this tank gap. So that helps me calculate this thing. And so what we're going to do in a second is um, then put tank gap into the flow, and that will be the things that are specific to the toilet. The rest of it will be generic. It applies to any stock and flow model. So any questions about this so far, that this tank gap or the setup of this or where we're going? Makes sense so far. Okay. All right. Stop me if I get going too fast or anything like that. I want to make sure everybody's on board. So, um, so the next step, we got our tank gap. So we kind of follow, uh, you know, water level to tank gap, tank gap to flow of water. Now we have enough information we can put in the flow of water formula, and the flow of water formula is easy. It's just a copy of tank gap the way we've written it. So if I look up here. Tank gap is equal to this. So it's like target water level, that's B2. Um, tank gap, uh, that is D5. And I calculate that by doing B2 minus B5. That's what went there. And then now that I've got tank gap, which is D5, I can just put that directly into flow of water. Flow of water equals tank gap. Well, here's flow of water. So you go to D5 there. And so I can fill that in there. And so that now that I've filled out all of the flows, then this row here is all, um, or these two images capture all of the formulas that are specific to the toilet. What I'm gonna fill in down here are filling in the stock formulas and the stock formulas are gonna look exactly like the bacteria stock formulas because stocks evolve the same way, regardless of the system. What changes from system to system are the flows. As long as you got the flow formulas, then the stocks just move along like that other system. So the flows configure the system. So any questions about either of these two formulas here, the flow of water or the tank gap? And we can see initially the tank gap is gonna be 15 because that is going to be 15 minus water level. And that's what gives me an initial gap of 15. Okay, questions online, everybody good? Okay. All right, so now we can do our generic stock update formulas. So time is sort of like a stock. So um, it has a very similar formula to a stock update. It's just the previous time plus the time step. So that's what we got there. So if we're to think about um, calculus wise, if you think about time as a stock, then the flow of time is like dt dt equal to one. So if you think about this, this is exactly a stock update formula for time. It's like time plus its flow, which is equal to one times dt. 
So that's where that kind of comes from there. And, um, and then I need to actually update the water level one. And that's the more generic version of the stock update formula, which is just the previous water level, B5, plus C5, which is the flow from the previous time step, times our DT value, which we've set up here is 0.01. And that gives us our water level flow. And those are all of the formulas we need to simulate the toilet. We grab um, the bottom rows here. We buy this guy, this guy, and these two. And if we were to pull those down, then we'll simulate the behavior of the toilet over time. So any questions about that? And why? Well, I mean, I'm going to do it. In the next slide, we'll actually see the output from that. Questions online. And again, this is basically assignment D2. So, all right. Okay, so I fill those down. And, um, and here's what I get out of it. Um, I have plotted, I think I only ask you in assignment D2 to plot the water level. I've gone ahead and plot the water level and the flow of water. The water level is blue. That's the water in the toilet. And the flow of water coming into the toilet from the wall is this orange color. So we can see initially the flow is high and it goes down to zero as the toilet settles down. And initially the water level is zero as it's empty, but then it rises slowly and slowly um, to 15 um, and eventually stops around 15. And um, so that's, I'm just plotting here time on the x-axis and either water level in blue or flow of water in orange. So you can see water level starts at zero, flow water starts at 15, water level climbs, flow of water uh, de uh, declines or decays. So does this plot make sense? I mean, if you think about it, um, if you think about flushing a toilet, it's loudest initially, and then it gets quieter and quieter until it just sort of claps off. And there's a nonlinearity which causes it to turn. And now if you really think about the math here, um, this flow of water will never actually get exactly to zero. And this water level will never actually get exactly to 15. So they put a little mechanical nonlinearity in the valve so that when things get sufficiently low on flow, it just snaps it and turns the water off. And that's what causes your toilet to eventually turn off. But roughly speaking, this is a decent approximation of what happens in a normal toilet is that that's why you've got kind of a loud noise up front as it's filling and then it gets quieter and quieter. And it might get kind of squeakier and higher pitched as the flows get smaller and that nonlinearity starts to clap that thing off, uh, you know, sort of pinch it off kind of like, like wax or something or like a, like a balloon being pulled tight. So, um, so that's kind of what's going on here. So does this plot make sense to you that fast flow initially, slow flow over time, and it kind of settles out at 15? So if you, so hopefully so your goal for assignment D2 is to replicate this so that you get this plot and you can do things like play with DT, see what happens. You can try playing with the water level, see what happens. And then the bonus, add a leak, um, just like you add a death flow in uh, the bacteria. So that'll mean adding another flow here. So this will be the inflow of water and then you also have an outflow of water and you'll have to then update the stock update formulas to be instead of just the inflow, it'll be inflow minus outflow. So if I were to go back, this formula here, it's got B1 times C5. Well, you can imagine putting parentheses around C5 and then doing inflow minus outflow. And, um, and then that's pretty much all that you'll, you'll need to do for that. So uh, I'll pause here. Questions about that? That makes sense. Now, what's cool about this is it's, I, you know, the math here, there's a little bit of math, right? But they're relatively simple expressions. And you get this nice, smooth curve out here. If I were to go back to SOS 211 or any generic uh, calculus course, and I were to give you this expression here, which would be, you know, DDT water level, the change in water level over time is equal to some constant water level 15 minus that water level. So, Imagine this is dx dt equals 15 minus x and ask you to solve it, then you would get um, an expression um, that would be evaluated as looking, I thought I had the expression here. Um, oh yeah, there it is down here. You would end up getting this expression down here, which is the water level over time 
is equal to the eventual asymptotic water level, the target water level times this expression, one minus e to the negative t. And if you were to plot this thing, it would be the blue line. So um, it's kind of a headache to get from here to here mathematically. Um, you know, you have to group all the water levels together. You might have some one overs. You might have to do a logarithmic substitution or whatever. Um, to do this analytically requires a lot of steps and, um, and some specialized knowledge about how to solve these ordinary differential equations. But um, numerically, um, we can, for any one of these differential equations, we don't need to know the tricks to solve this differential equation or that differential equation or whatever. We end up getting the exact same curve out. The downside is we don't get the formula out, but if you were to plot this formula, you just get the curve. So if we, um, you know, in doing a systems analysis problem, really only care about the shape of these curves or where these curves hit particular performance levels at certain times and those sorts of things, then this is this is pretty good. Um, and um, oftentimes we might actually get uh, a description of what's going on um, for time points that might be you know difficult. Like there are some uh, differential equations that you can't get the expression over time. All you can do is find out where they're going to be as time goes to infinity. So you might be able to only figure out that this toilet eventually hits 15, but you don't actually be able to get figure out where it is at time 10. Um, whereas when we do it numerically, we can actually estimate where it is at time 10. So it's pretty powerful and it doesn't require a lot of mathematical baggage in order to get it done. So that's um, why these SIM tools are so nice. So questions about this, that makes sense. Questions online. Just going to do a sort of a organization here so I can see things a little better. Okay. All right. So um, how do we actually build these models and interpret these expressions? So, um, you know, throughout the rest of the semester, you're going to be looking at dynamical systems models that are written in terms of stocks and flows where all of the system information will be built into the flow expression. So we need to sort of know how to interpret these flows so we can build them and so we can read them when we look at how other people build them. And so when we look at a flow here, um, flows, generally speaking, usually can be kind of factored into these two parts where there's some stock amount divided by some time interval. And flows will always be in units of whatever the stock units are divided by the time units for the system. So if the stock is in centimeters, the flow will be in centimeters per second. Um, if the stock is in centimeters per second, the flow will be in centimeters per second per second. So um, you're always gonna add a per time interval to whatever the stock unit is there. And the way we interpret this, like remember that toilet, um, it started out like looking like a line that was like a rocket taking off at a particular angle. So if I were to sort of um, draw my um, in interpretation of that or, or, or the toilet uh, model, then remember the toilet kind of rose up like that, where it initially started off like a straight line. And then as the flow got kind of pinched back, then the, the water level uh, leveled off. Well, the way we interpret the flow at any particular point is if the valve stayed on for, um, for that amount of time forever, then, then in that hypothetical case, after uh, this time interval, we would move the stock up this amount. So when the flow is initially 15 here, what we're saying is after one second, the water level would go up all 15 centimeters. So, um, but what actually happens is that after um, you know, a half a second of that flow, the flow um, starts decreasing. So the flow isn't constant over time. So that's why it's a little confusing, but it's an, remember, it's a derivative. It's the instantaneous rate of change of the stock. And so if the flow stayed on at this level constantly, the stock would rise this amount in this time interval. But because the flow is changing over time, that probably won't end up happening for the system, but that's how we interpret it at any instant of time. 
So if a flow is 15, that means a stock would rise 15 if the flow stayed there for the whole second. Uh, or I could interpret 15 as 30 over two, which would mean like it would rise 30 in two seconds if it stayed on for that amount of time and so on and so forth. So that's how we interpret these flows. Let me get back to PowerPoint here. All right, so like, how do we apply that to the systems we've seen? Well, in the bacterial system, um, our flow was the number of bacteria in the system at that time, times one over W, where W was the waiting time between reproduction events. And so the population inflow was the number of bacteria divided by the average reproduction time. So this is saying that if um, we had, we, if that flow stayed that way forever, then every W time units, you would add number of bacteria to the population. But of course, what's happening is that once you add a little bit of bacteria to the system, they start reproducing and the flow rate goes up. So in the next instant of time, the flow goes up. And so it doesn't always stay constant, but the way we interpret it is for that instant, who's contributing to reproduction? At that instant, only the currently alive bacteria are contributing to reproduction. And this is how high, this is the hose is turned on at this amount. But it's kind of like if your hose was turned on and as it's filling the bucket, there's like a sensor seeing as the bucket's being filled, if it were to turn the hose on even more based on how high the bucket was, then, um, then that bucket would get filled faster and faster and faster. And that's the exponential growth of bacteria. So that's how we interpret this particular flow expression. If these number of bacteria were the only ones ever reproducing, then bacteria population would grow linearly where they would add this number of bacteria every W time units. But because new bacteria start reproducing too, they grow non-linearly and that's the exponential growth that we see. But at the instant of time, we approximate them with linear growth. And this is the rate of change for the linear growth. So does that make sense what I mean by flow in terms of bacteria? It's a little abstract, but um, so when we form these things, we often ask like, oh, this is a growth problem. Well, what's the current flow for this growth problem? And we could say, well, um, you know, we want to sort of know what's the average time until we get a reproduction event and how many things are reproducing. So these are how many things are reproducing. This is the average time to reproduction event. That is the typical flow when we've got a growth problem that we're modeling. And it could be growth in police in a city. It could be growth in students in a pop in a you know, anything that where the number of individuals ends up creating um, uh, like through reputation, the students really like the school. And so with more students at the school, you get more new students at the school, then we can kind of model it this way. Okay. So, um, and this is just me kind of saying, you know, summarizing that here. So if we waited for average time to reproduction, each of the current number of bacteria would reproduce and there'd be number of bacteria, more bacteria. So the population growth rate is the current number of bacteria divided by the average time of reproduction, exactly what I just said. So um, likewise, the death flow, we think of the same way. And we are to sort of say um, that, that bacteria deaths per unit time at, at that instant of time, then this many bacteria are each contributing one over L to the outflow of deaths. And so the population death rate at an instant are the number of bacteria divided by the average lifetime. Now, that's, uh, you know, as the number, as bacteria start to die, the death rate will be reduced because there'll be fewer bacteria dying. But if somehow we could constantly be pulling bacteria out at this rate, this would mean that we could eliminate that in average lifetime, we would actually kill all of the bacteria. So it's like, at exactly average lifetime, all of the bacteria would go away. And that's not gonna happen because the number of bacteria, I mean, basically if we're to plot the bacteria curve over time, we have some number of bacteria and, um, and this approximation, the flow might look like this, where this is W. And this is saying that um, for some number of back over W unit time, if this death flow stayed constant, these bacteria would all be dead in W time. But in reality, what the curve looks like is more like this, where it starts off at that flow rate, 
But as you get more bacteria dying, then there's fewer contributions to death. And so um, the bacteria end up sort of dying off slower than would be expected if this was a straight line. So, um, so that's what we're kind of saying. What is the rate of change at this instant? And it's gonna typically be, again, the number of individuals causing that rate of change divided by the average time in between events per each individual. That's how we write that flow. Does that kind of make sense? At least start to be kind of merged. And again, the, the units are always going to be stock divided by time, bacteria per second, for example. Okay. So the guidelines here for these population type systems is that we measure the average time it takes for an individual to be added to the stock. Um, this is for growth, but you know, for death, it'd be also to be taken away from the stock. And the contribution to the inflow rate for each individual will be one divided by that time. And then so the contribution for the whole population will be however many individuals there are times that one over time, each one of their individual contributions. And then you get rid of the one and it just becomes individuals divided by time. So, um, so that's how we get for the inflow contribution. The outflow can be written the same way where every individual is contributing one to the outflow um, per average time, whatever that average time is. So the outflow will be number of individuals divided by that time. So if, the, if, they, uh, if it takes W time units for them to be born, then the inflow will be individuals divided by W. If it takes L time units for them to die, then the uh, outflow contribution will be the number of individuals divided by L. So in any case, it's, you know, the units help you here because it's not times W or times L because you always want it the number of stock divided by time. And that kind of gives you a hint that if you know W and L, you're going to do number of individuals divided by time. So does that make sense for these population type systems? General guidelines for any time populations are growing or declining. All right, and then we got the other types of systems like this, um, these kind of balancing systems where it's harder to think of them as growth systems. And so how do we interpret um, the flow rates here? Well, um, I kind of talked about this already for the toilet. Um, if the valve is maintained at this flow for one second, the remaining tank gap will be filled with water. So this is the flow of water that we implemented um, inside uh, the spreadsheet. Now, remember I said um, it should raise some red flags to those of you really paying attention that flow of water should be in centimeters per second and tank gap was in centimeters. And here's where it comes together. There's a hidden one that I, we don't have implemented in the spreadsheet because it's just divided by one, but where we are making the assumption that the, that the valve has been configured so that it pumps in water at this rate of, um, of 15 centimeters per second when the tank gap's equal to zero. And so if we bought another valve from the hardware store, um, it might have a different rate here or a different time here. But um, so we, you know, for simplicity, um, I just said, let's just set it equal to tank gap exactly. But by setting the flow equal to tank gap, then what I'm saying here is that the flow is so high that after one second, the entire tank gap will be destroyed if the flow were to stay on that amount. Now, in reality, the flow is gonna get pinched off very quickly as the water goes up, and that's gonna cause uh, the tank gap to take longer than one second to get automatically filled. So that's what I'm saying here. Because the valve rate is constantly changing, the tank gap will never actually be reduced to zero. But if it were left on at this flow for the whole uh, for continuous time, and after one second, we close the whole tank gap. So, um, so that's kind of what we're going there. So for these types of systems, so bucket-like stocks that empty or fill and then stop, the way we choose our flow expressions is that the inflow rate is typically written as the gap size um, at any time. So, you know, if we're thinking about the flow, just if you have the gap in your system, it's gap size divided by T, where T is, and this is where it gets a little weird, it's the average time it'll take uh, for closing the gap by this weird number, 63.21%. And that's not an arbitrarily chosen number. Um, we'll learn about that number a little bit later as we go. And I think I, I say, yeah, here, sometimes this is called the so-called time constant of a system. 
So it's just for convenience that if you do the math on these types of systems, then someone figured out, like, ideally, I'd like to know how to write this formula as this simple expression, gap size divided by T. How do I figure out that T by looking at a real toilet? And they, they figured out that, that, well, if you measure where uh, the time at which the toilet is filled to 63.21%, that time will correspond to exactly this time here. This is like a half-life. But it's sort of been um, real. It's it's sort of been extended. It's not exactly a half life. A half life would be like fifty percent. That would be like the time until um, you've closed at fifty percent of the time. But if we were to choose that time, then this expression would be uglier. There'd be like natural log of twos in here somewhere. So in order to make a nice clean expression as your flow, where it's just gap size divided by t, then this tells us we look at the real system. We measure where they hit sixty three point two one percent. So it's kind of like Let's say you go to a hardware store and buy a bunch of different valves and you like to simulate each one of them. Well, you could install um, each valve and in, a, in a toilet and you could then um, flush it and then set a stopwatch uh, so you could paint a line on the tank. And when it hits 63% of the total fill, 63% of 15 centimeters, then just record that time. And in that time, for each valve so for some valves it might be five seconds for some valves it might be one second that would be the time constant for that valve and that represents kind of the stubbornness of the system and you can put that in your simulation and that helps you calibrate your simulation to the actual valve that you bought at the store so um so that's uh, kind of uh, you know how we match data to these sims with this so-called time constant all right so um, so for our system, does one second seem like a normal consumer time constant? I would say that's probably pretty fast because, um, you know, after one second, I don't think the water in most toilets goes up you know, more than half of the tank, you know, 63%. So if we were actually simulating a real toilet, I probably wouldn't have given you the, the expression flow is equal to tank gap. I would have probably given you flow is equal to tank gap divided by... 20 or something like that, which would mean that after 20 seconds, it goes up 63%. So, but this just for simplicity, I said flow is equal to tank gap. And that implicitly was telling you we're modeling a really fast toilet where it closes the gap 63% in a second. So does that make sense for these kind of bucket-like problems? You, um, uh, when I say bucket-like problems, these are problems where they're balancing loops that eventually settle out to balance themselves out. And this time constant is 63% of the, of how long it takes to get rid of any disturbance. Okay. Questions online? Yeah. Yeah, if, if you want, this nice formula here, where it's the stock amount divided by the time interval. Well, in this case, in these negative feedback loops, it's typically going to be gap size divided by some parameter t. If you're trying to figure out what is the level, what this is an exogenous parameter, so I got it's got to I got to get it from somewhere. I got to sort of set it by looking at data in the real world. Then the way we do that is by we do what's called a, and we'll talk about this more um, I think just after the midterm. But we do what's called a step response. And what that means is we hit a system with a sudden step in, in the, we go say, you know, you, here were the, 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 what we were desired uh, before some time step. And then at some magic time step, we increase the desired, uh, uh, um, what we desire. So in this case, the toilet, it's like suddenly at the time we flush, we suddenly desire it to refill 15 centimeters. And then we just measure in the real system how long it takes for it to come back to that desired level. And, um, and then we just set that T to be the 63.21%. And so if the formula is this, then that's the one we get. Now, um, there are some say physicists out there who are more accustomed to thinking in terms of half-life. And so when they build their flow expressions, they might actually write this expression with, and like you'd say, you'd see a bunch of natural log twos in this sort of thing. And in that case, um, they would know that, well, actually, I want to measure the time until, let's say they're measuring the decay of some radioactive substance. 
Well, in that case, they would say, well, how long until I get 50% of the substance? And that would, they plug this in here, but you couldn't plug that into this formula because this formula isn't designed for half-life. If you did that, again, you would need extra parameters to scale that. So this is just a scaled version of half-life. And in our systems, it's easier to, it, I would rather not have a bunch of ugly natural logs floating around in this formula. And so the downside of that is I have to choose an ugly percentage. But if I wanted a clean percentage, like 50%, then I would need some ugly other pr parameters inside here. Does that make sense? A little abstract. Any other questions? Okay. And I can actually show you where this 63.21% comes from. It's actually um, related to um, e to the negative one. So this is basically, if you're wondering, if you were to calculate um, you know, this 63.21%, if you're interested, that is uh, one minus e to the negative one. So um, Euler's number is whatever around 2.7. So if you do one divided by 2.7 and then do um, one minus that, then you should get something around 63.21%. Uh, so um, where this comes from, I could go back and show you, but for time, I'm not gonna really worry about it kind of outside the scope of the class. But if you were to go back and look at the formula for, um, for how the toilet tank fills, then you might be able to figure out like, oh, okay, so I see where T shows up in that formula. If I want um, to solve for T, um, then what time sort of makes T pop out nicely, then it'll be the time associated with uh, this percentage, this one minus E to the minus one. So that's where that weird number comes from. And I just remember it as like, I start with six. I remember it's roughly 60%, and then the rest is just three, two, one. So I know it's four digits, it starts with a six and the bottom numbers are three, two, one and there, I memorized the whole thing. So it's just sort of a common, one of those numbers that you just learn to memorize over time. All right, any other questions about that? Great. All right, um, so, uh, so that's, that's the toilet example. So now generically stock and flow diagrams, we wanna learn how to um, draw those and then some an insight maker. So um, in any tool that you, any system dynamics modeling tool you go into, you'll have stocks. Um, again, sometimes they're called state variables sometimes they're called accumulators, levels or box variables, but the most common name um, in the literature is stocks. Um, and they are, these are um, four different programs. So this is insight maker here, then sim up here, um, I think this is uh, AnyLogic, and this is, I think, Stella. So four different programs, four different depictions, but you kind of get the point. They're generally uh, depicted as boxes. Um, a lot of times, uh, like in Stella, they actually show the boxes partially full. Um, in VinSim, they'll actually plot the stock levels over time in the middle of them. Um, so that's a stock. The flows are often depicted this way. So the common element here is it's a thick directional line. Um, very often they have little valve symbols here. This is supposed to be like a spigot, like a valve here. Um, so if you looked kind of at the top of this thing down, you could kind of see how this might look sort of like a valve. And this is in fluid dynamics, the common symbol for valve. So VinSim uh, draws it like that. Uh, this is Stella, this is AnyLogic. Um, and the web tool um, insight maker, they just didn't bother with trying to implement that. So they just made a thick uh, line instead, um, which I think is totally reasonable, but, um, but traditionally it's common to depict some sort of valve. And then converters, um, these are just extra parameters or to extra formulas to help make the math easier. And they're often drawn as little circles or ovals. And so, uh, VinSim up here, um, down here in Insight Maker, looks like this. Um, there's uh, in any logic, uh, they look like little circles here. Stella looks like a circle. So common thing, they're just drawn as circles to differentiate themselves from stocks, which are boxes. And then links. And so links are usually thin lines, often um, kind of curved. Sometimes uh, they're dashed. Um, sometimes they're called causal links, sometimes they're called informational links. Um, 
we just, I just, I'm going to call them links in this class. In Moorcroft's chapter, the chapter you're about to read for next week, uh, I think he differentiates initially between a causal link and an informational link. But throughout the rest of the book, he doesn't really uh, you know, care about the differences there. Um, what we mean by kind of difference in causal link and informational link is that some links, um, it's clear there's kind of a causal influence we can label like with pluses and minuses, but others, they're just information needed to calculate a formula, but there's no obvious like up and down relationship. And so we just need it. So it's informational, but we can't say this has a positive effect on this or that. So there's maybe a distinction between causal and informational, but it's not important. So as far as I'm concerned, um, it's just a link. So again, thin, usually curved, sometimes dashed. Sometimes we can annotate them with plus minus S and O if it's possible, but it's not necessary to do so. So in a causal loop diagram, you gotta label everything, links and loops. In a stock and flow diagram, you are free to, but you're not gonna be taken off if you don't. So you only have to draw the stocks, the flows and the links. You don't have to annotate them in a stock and flow diagram. All right, so any questions about those three constructs, graphical constructs, before we do some examples and then show Vincent? Okay. All right, so quick examples here. Um, if I'm modeling a bank, I might have um, my desired bank balance across all my balances. I might have all my balances, and then I might have a gap between desired and actual. Now, up here, if I drew this in VinSim, I can drill down into this gap between desired and actual and put a formula in, desired bank balance minus all bank balances. But VinSim is gonna give me an error because I didn't draw any links. You can only put a formula inside a converter or a flow if there is a link going into it from the variables you're gonna use in the formula. So in this case, I'm using desired bank balance and all bank balances inside this formula up here. So I need to draw those incoming links coming into there. And if I draw both of them, then VinSim will not report any errors in this formula. So I draw them to give this uh, uh, variable or converter um, access to this information. Now, um, because if I want my bank balances to change over time, then this isn't a dynamical model because I have no stocks. So changing over time implies I need stocks. So the full model is going to have um, you know, a savings account balance and it's a stock because it potentially changes over time by interest. And the checking account balance changes over time by salary. So that's the flow going into those two things. So the links that are definitely missing here are that, well, since I have all bank balances, I can't calculate all bank balances unless I add up these two. So that's something that's missing. I have to bring savings account balance into all bank balances and checking into all bank balances. So that all bank balances can be the sum of those two. And I can't know the interest going into my savings account without knowing how much money is already in my savings account. So I have to draw that going into the flow. And this gives us kind of a minimal model of the bank. So my salary doesn't depend upon my checking account. It just comes in you know, weekly or bi-weekly. The interest depends on how much is in the savings. And then these formulas, so these are, this is my goal in my head. This is uh, the gap between those things. And so if I had another behavioral model, I could use maybe this gap to drive like my, you know, how much spending I have on uh, movies or things like that. So I could add that into it. So any questions about the links drawn here? Does this sort of like in order for me to do, to make these formulas work, I have to draw these links. Does that make sense? Questions online? Okay. All right, so um, whenever uh, we have a generic stock and an inflow, um, so when I'm thinking about causality, um, there is our implied causal links that we don't usually draw, but when we're analyzing feedback loops, we have to remember they're there. So I already mentioned this before, an inflow versus an outflow. An inflow is such that if you, you were to increase the inflow a little bit later, you would increase the stock. So there is an implicit causal link or positive link between inflow and stock. So um, this, implicit causal link is not usually drawn because it's kind of chart junk because it's always there, but we have to remember that it's there. Similarly, on the outflow side of things, if the outflow gets bigger, 
the stock will get smaller. So this is one that's easy to forget about because the flow is pointed to misdirection. But because it's an outflow, there's a causal link pointing back at the stock. So again, we don't usually draw that, but we have to remember it's there because that might complete a feedback loop. And if we are only looking at the directions of the flows, we're gonna miss that feedback loop. So, um, so that we have to remember is there, even if we don't draw it explicitly. Are there questions about why this is here? Does this make sense that there is a negative relationship? If you increase the outflow, you'll ultimately have a negative impact on the stock level and vice versa. So if you increase the leak and the toilet, it will ultimately reduce the water level in the toilet. If you decrease the leak, it'll raise the water level in the toilet. Okay. So if I put those things together, this is my general inflow and outflow. And again, these are implicit links. So I've got them dashed here. Um, we always have to remember they're there, but we'll typically not draw them. So we might draw, these would be explicit links like stock going back to the inflow, stock going to the outflow. This might be a population system where the number of fish in the population has uh, an impact on its inflow and also an impact on its outflow. And what I want you to see here is um, that these are the correct feedback loop polarities. So over here, this might make sense to you that if I have a negative link going to inflow, there's an implicit positive link back to stock. So there's a balancing loop here because there's one negative link. What's often confusing is that there's a negative link from stock to outflow. This is a reinforcing loop. And that's because there's another negative link coming back into stock. And those two negative links create a reinforcing loop. So if you forgot about the negative link coming back here, you might not even see the loop. So does that make sense? Does everybody see these two loops? It's tricky if you're, like, until you get used to looking at it. The online okay? All right. So. So the steps to adding these annotations. So here's a simple stock and flow diagram for our bacteria that's in VinSim. Let's say you draw it all black and white without annotations. Uh, the first thing you might do is say, are there consistent causal relationships that I can annotate? And I'd say, yeah, okay. As I increase average lifetime, it decreases death rate. As I increase death rate, it increases death. So as I increase bacteria, it increases death. So I could go through and I can label um, all of these polarities um, if possible. And then, in my head at least, and then maybe explicitly at first, I can draw the implicit positive link from the inflows, and I can draw the implicit negative link from the outflows. So I add those two things in, at least while I'm analyzing this thing, and that will reveal loops. And so I can see, oh, there's a reinforcing loop here, and there's a balancing loop here. I might have missed that balancing loop if I didn't draw that thing coming back. So, so that's good that I drew those. But I have to keep in mind that most of my readers might be familiar with causal loop diagrams already. And the chart junk that's kind of here, like these implicit ones that I drew down here for my analysis, are going to maybe confuse them because there's like extra lines. And they might be wondering, like, if since that's implicit anyway, why did you add it on there? Are you trying to communicate something to me? Is there something extra going on? So it's conventional to get rid of those. And you just have to trust that um, your reader who's familiar with stock and flow diagrams uh, will understand that there's an implicit negative link here and an implicit positive link here. So this is the typical way if we were annotating these stock and flow diagrams, how we would do it. So any questions about that? Like does, do these links and loop polarities make sense? Questions online? All right, great. So um, for this simple example, we've got our stock and flow diagram for our toilet model here. And so um, if I wanna generate a causal loop diagram based on this, then it's, I, the first thing I do is I take all of my variables and I throw them into the causal loop diagram. And the causal links that are already here are easy to draw. Like here's the water level to tank gap. Well, here's water level to tank gap. Target water level to tank gap. Well, here's target water level to tank gap. Tank gap to flow water, tank gap to flow water, that's easy. But I have to remember when I'm drawing that CLD that there's an implicit link going from here to here. 
And so that's what I put into the causal loop. So if I convert a stock and flow to a causal loop diagram, then I definitely have to put in all of those implicit links that are left out in the stock and flow diagram. All right. So that makes sense for everybody to see the implicit links. An easy thing for me to throw at you at a midterm saying like, find all the loops in the stock and flow diagram. You have to make sure to look for those. Okay, great. All right, so um, we've got a few more minutes left here. So let me um, show you how to draw and simulate these things. I'll do a, a, a VinSim uh, example here. I'm gonna keep it short. And I'm going to try to do Insight Maker. If I can't do Insight Maker uh, today, I'll start next time with the Insight Maker example. But there's video tutorials that are available on Canvas for both of these. So you can also take a look there. Um, and for whatever reason, my Vincent video tutorials, like my most popular like YouTube video, I think it's gotten like, I don't know, 30,000 views or something like that in the last couple of years. Um, so I don't know why. I think it tells me that VinSim or Vintana Systems needs better, uh, you know, documentation or something. But, um, but it's, you know, 10, 15 minutes long. So you can take a look if you think it will help. So let me um, pull up VinSim. And if you'd like, you can also pull up VinSim. Let me get the... Uh... Mouse back, maybe I'll bite the bullet and stop the share. All right, so we're in Vincent here. Okay, and I think I've got the, um, yeah, so this is the new sketch environment. So um, I've mentioned to, to a couple of people, if you have issues with Vincent stability or um, other things like that, it's, it's a good idea to try going to tools um, up here and then down to switch back to old GUI. Uh, but we'll try it in the new one here. So um, now we're just going to add a couple of, uh, of, of buttons up here that we haven't used so far. So uh, one of them is stock and the other one is flow. So if I want to create a simple like bacterial model, um, the first thing I do is click on stock and I can go over here and I can type in like bacteria or number of bacteria or something like that. Uh, I'll make this a little bit bigger and maybe I'll go and change my defaults. Um, I'll go up here. I think I right clicked and, oh, there's my defaults it's over there. I just couldn't see it. So I'm just gonna increase my font size a little bit for projection regions. Okay, that's not so bad. All right, so bacteria now, um, so that's a stock. So it's drawn with a, a big box like that. Um, I'll also add my flows so I can click on the flow variable here and I can um, I, I click where I want the flow to start and where I want it to end. Um, if the inflow doesn't have another stock that's connected to, I can just click on the um, uh, the blank canvas and I'll save this. And it will put a little cloud there. And that cloud just means that this is an unlimited inflow. It's not going to pull from any other stock. So it's just kind of coming from out of nowhere. And I can call this births. And then if I want an outflow, I can click on the stock and click on a random spot in the canvas and call that deaths like we've been doing. Any trouble with that? Anybody try, any, who, who is playing along at home or, or whatever? Does this seem okay so far? The important thing to get to is the formulas, which we'll do here in a second. Um, and then um, even though the example that I did um, in the slide notes, I had uh, the average lifetime and the birth rate, um, I'm just gonna do average lifetime and then incorporate the average lifetime into this formula, um, as well as the um, uh, average uh, time between reproduction. So if I were to click on, uh, again, I went to variable here, the A, A for auxiliary or variable. If I click on a spot, and I type in um, average time to reproduction. Uh, and if I wanna move that, get it 
up here. Maybe I'll move this down. And then I can also create another variable called average lifetime. And then I just need to draw links to make my formulas work. And so um, I know that my average time to reproduction sets the birth rate for the population. I know the average li lifetime sets the death rate for the population. But I also know that the number of births depends on the number of bacteria that are reproducing. And likewise, number of deaths depends on that. So I have to draw those feedbacks as well. So I do um, bacteria goes into births. And remember, I can grab this little handle, curve it up. Bacteria goes into deaths. I can grab this little handle and bring it up. So that's pretty much just like drawing a causal loop diagram. And those are all the links that I need to make this go. And now I just need to put the formulas in. So any questions about any of that? Okay. All right, so now um, there's another button up here, equation that we haven't used before. And by the way, in the new sketch, for those of you on, a, on these Macs that are having trouble right clicking, there's this button they've added appearance, which is the equivalent of a right click. And so if you click on that and then click on something else, it's equivalent to right clicking that thing. So if I go to function or equation, this f of x here, um, when I immediately click on that, it changes the background color of anything that doesn't have an equation or whose equation is broken because of the addition or removal of a recent variable. And so I can now go up through here, if I click on average time to reproduction, and it unfortunately put that on my other screen. So I need to drag it over here. And so this brings up this, this is new. This is our equation dialogue in Vincent. And, um, and we can see which equation we're editing up here, average time to reproduction. And, um, and over here, there's a quick way to jump to all of the other equations if we didn't wanna go back and forth. So if I were to click on birth, death, so it would switch to that equation. And, um, and it says here, this is a constant, which is true. I, the average time to reproduction, I'm gonna go in and put in, um, I think we said the average time to reproduction was 0.75 time units. So I'm just gonna put 0.75 in there. We'll actually deal with how to use real units after the midterm. For now, I'm just gonna put this constant 0.75. And, um, and that's all I need to put there. So I can click okay. Now let's look at one that's more exotic births. So this is an inflow. If I click on that births, brings up these uh, equations here. This um, says type auxiliary. That automatically is filled in whenever a variable is coming into another variable because it's an auxiliary. It's, it's going to be a formula is basically what it's saying. And all of the things that come into it are listed in this box over here. So down here in this box, it says average time to reproduction in bacteria. Those are the two variables I'm allowed to use in this formula because of the links that are coming in. So um, I can click on them or type them in. So I can click uh, bacteria divided by, um, I didn't mean to click bacteria divided by bacteria, bacteria divided by average time of reproduction. And that is my inflow right there. It's just like bacteria divided by, I think I called it W. All right, so, um, so that's how I set up that flow formula. Any questions of that? You see, these are all the things that the inflows uh, gave me access to. If I were to, if they weren't there and I were to type them in, when I tried to run it, it would give me an error. It would say that, oh, you know, that formula doesn't have access to that. Okay. So then let's look at uh, average lifetime. Very similar to birth, it's a constant again. I'll put a three in there to match the spreadsheet. Go down here to okay. And then again, deaths. And notice again, it's got bacteria is going in, average lifetimes going in. So that should show up as being available for me to use. So I'll go to deaths. And so I do bacteria divided by average lifetime. You give us my flow formula. And that's how I get the outflow. All right. Everybody good with that? Good. And then we can do the last important thing, the stock. Now, when you click on the stock, 
you never ever ever in this class touch this upper part of the equation where it says integ that's automatically filled in uh, for you by Vincent. So, um, and I just I want to emphasize this because this will come up in some of the first homeworks, whatever. People will try to update this formula. You never ever update that formula. Let, let Vincent do it for you as you draw the diagram. The only thing you update is the initial value. And so here, I'm just going to put in that there's one bacteria initially. See that down here? Just this one here. Leave that alone. Let it Vincent do that. And then Vinsim should be okay. So if I go down here and click okay, all of those uh, black backgrounds are gone. The last thing I need to go do is go up to this model menu and then go to settings. And that is what, if I go to model settings, then um, in this tab, time bounds, I look here and it basically tells me uh, what unit to use on my x-axis. And I think I don't want months there, so I'm gonna change it to like seconds. So I'll pull down here and I'll say second. Uh, I can say how many, you know, how long do I wanna simulate it for? And I'll just do five. And then here is my DT variable, time step. And, um, and so I am going to sort of match what we did in the spreadsheet. I'll just change that to like 0.001. Everybody see that? And just so we can at least get one sim out before we end here, I'll show you what happens when we run it. So I now have the ability to hit, go up here and hit simulate, this little play button. And when I do that, it appears like nothing happens, but it just generated data and now I need to tell it what data I want to plot. So if I go over here, I can click on, well, I can go up and I can select a variable. Like I want to plot, bacteria. Let's say I want to plot bacteria and births. And then if I go over and click on graph, now that those are selected, I just use the shift, by the way, I click on bacteria, I hit shift and click on births. And then if I click on this graph, then I can see um, both bacteria and births. I can turn off births or turn off bacteria, but I can see them growing just like they do in Excel. And that's great. Um, and, but let's say I wanted to actually pull that into Excel. Well, what I could have done instead of graph is I can click table time down. And when I do that, if you look closely here, it's got a time column and it's got a bacteria column and a births column. This is exactly what you manually generated when you, when you did this in Excel. And it's possible for me to go up and I think in the new uh, one here, if I go up to, I think file um, and I go to save, I have to do this when I'm in this, um, I can actually save this as, you know, bacteria.txt or something like that. And if I open this bacteria.txt in Excel, so maybe I'll see if I can open Excel. I don't wanna go much farther than this, but let me at least open it in Excel and then I'll let you guys go. If I, I think I just dumped that onto my desktop. Um, I'm going to say that it is a delimited file. Um, and I am going to tell it that it is tab delimited. It figured that out, put it into little columns. And so if I say finish, and then I bring this Excel over, then I get exactly the output that I would have gotten. Um, if I were to do this manually, but there's no formulas in there. But now I can use all the graphing tools in Excel to make even prettier graphs. So like I said, VinSim's just manually doing what you were doing by hand in Excel and dumping it out into a format that then now you can use in other tools to make even nicer graphs, but you can very quickly graph them in VinSim. All right, well, I'm gonna stop there because I don't wanna keep you guys any farther. I'm gonna do that exact same example in Insight Maker at the start of Tuesday's class. But otherwise, um, read the chapter. And um, rather than bothering with attendance, I'll just give everybody attendance for today since I'm running a little bit high. So have a good weekend. If you have any questions, feel free to come up. Anybody online who has questions, I'll, I'm happy to take them as well. Have a good weekend.
All right, looks like everybody's off, so I will end the.